Good morning. Welcome. Good to have everyone. Thank you for participating today. This time I'll call the Pauley County Board of Commissioners work session for September 19th to order. Ryan, if you'll bring up the list, please. Still got your phone on, I think I do. Need time to turn it off, but looks like we've got the, uh, the Baptist over here and the Methodist over here. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, uh, love to have you come forward at this time. Thank you for being here uh, and uh, bringing us our invitation and leading us into place. Stay in the grave. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that you've provided for us another day. You've given us strength to be here, and uh, we're grateful for that. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would acknowledge before you that you are the, the beginning of all wisdom and uh, all authority and all governance begins with you. Lord, I pray that you would give wisdom to those in this room, that your your glory would be evident in this room, and that we would honor you with all that we do. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. I haven't been very good at imitations. It's uh, Pastor Mike Parker from Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. And uh, also I didn't uh, introduce Sheriff Gary Govich, um, so he might throw something at me. Uh, the minutes for the September 10th, 2019 work session uh, are available, and also the September 10th, 2019 board meeting minutes. So uh, if you want to need to review those, take a look at them. Under announcements, um, as you know, we celebrated or we honored, we um, were aware again of the 9-11 incident and our highlights of the Patriots Day at the park uh, are part of our positively following this morning. Let's watch that together. Thank y'all for coming out here today to our Patriots Day. Memorial. 18 years ago, one of the men and women here, as well as the fire pump and the police department for New York City, Port Authority, uh, and many other first responders and public safety embarked on the country's largest rescue effort. They asked if uh, you knew exactly where you were on 9-11, I remember exactly where I was, sitting at a desk, um, talking to a customer as she was watching it on TV. Hey! 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 Being a United Airlines pilot and having lost two airplanes um, the day of 9-11, uh, we, that is close to home. 18 years ago was one of the saddest days in the United States history. We're today remembering the ones who gave their lives so their fellow Americans could live. At some point today, spend some time with your family and friends. Let them know how much you love them and care about them. This is an important day for the Baltimore Sheriff's Office because we do have a lot of people that did go to Iraq because of this act of violence. I want to thank everybody that came out today, and we'll do this again next year. Good job, Jeff Parkins and your team. The Planning Commission meeting uh, was, was scheduled for today at 2 p.m. It's been canceled. Uh, they do not have a quorum present, so that will be rescheduled. Uh, the four agenda items, uh, make sure I get the right, got a couple of agendas here. Um, under invited guests, we have none. Uh, bid awards, discuss action to purchase the high density shelving for the adult detention and law enforcement center for the low bidder American specialty in the amount of $129,827.46. Ms. Pollard to present. Thank you. Good morning. Um, CPS reached out to three different vendors, even though American Specialties was on the state contract, just to get comparison pricing. And um, that state contract pricing was 
the low bid pricing with American Specialties, and so we're recommending award for the high density shelving for the new detention center. And CPS is here if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Reports from committees and departments. Uh, we're very pleased to have Ms. Deidre Holden, the election supervisor, uh, to give us uh, an update on in just uh, general election reports. Thank you, Good morning. Good morning. Stay with me until I get my stuff together. I want to be um, brief. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to come talk to you all about things that are going on right now with elections. We are in the, the midst of it. We will be going into our November um, municipal election plus we have a county-wide special election for the East West. Um, I want to talk to you today about two things, which is changing of some polling locations and also um, our new voting system. We have approximately just over 118,000 voters in Holland County. That is an increase of 19,052 since we ended the November, or actually the December 2018 election. We are growing. I have stood here before and tell you, you see it every day, this county is growing. And with growth comes change, and nobody likes change. And I say that because we are seeing most of our growth, as you all know, on the eastern side of this county, from the Cobb County line north of the Cedar Crest area, all the way down to the Douglas County line in the southern part of the county. And that's where we're seeing a lot of our voter population. It was necessary for us to do something to accommodate the voters in that area. So we decided that we would add some polling locations, change some precincts to make those additions. And that's what we have come up with. We are currently working on these changes. We um, are increasing from 12 precincts to 17. And we are adding back two additional early voting locations. We will always early vote here at the Watson Complex. And we are adding Burnt Hickory Park to service the north part of the county and the Diane Wright Innovation Center to accommodate the southern portion of the county. Um, when we are um, questioned about withdrawing from the schools, um, I wanted to let everyone know that it is a situation to where, number one, it's a safety concern for our students that attend those schools. I have met with our school superintendent, and um, we don't have an issue in November because school is not in session. However, we do have an issue in May when the primary is set and it's the last week of school. It's hard for the school system to call, election, call school on that day. We also have runoff elections now off of the November election, and those are conducted in December. And school is in session when that is conducted. So we felt that it was best for us to begin withdrawing from the schools and finding locations in our community that people will not be affected, especially our kids. So we have, um, we were originally, when we had our 12 precincts, we were in eight schools. We are now in four, and one of those does not have any children. Three are housed with students, and one is the Diana Innovation Center. We are trying to acclimate our voters to this change before the 2020 election year happens. That is why we made the decision to do this, because 2020 is not a time you want to open the gates and start changing polling locations. It wouldn't be anything that I would even consider doing. But we wanted to get them acclimated because we have the opportunity with a countywide election this November for the voters to know where the new polling location will be. Um, we are expecting huge turnouts in 2020. We saw a 62% turnout in November. I think we will start leaning more towards the 65 to 70 percent. I would love nothing more to see a 100 percent, but I don't think I'll ever see that. But hopefully we can get to those numbers. People are voting. People are 
involved and they are concerned and they should be so I'm excited to see those numbers continually to go up um, so with that being said we are moving forward we are still in the discussions of our polling locations we are excited about those we are thankful for the people who have allowed us to come into their communities and use their facilities and we think it's going to be um, a better opportunity for our voters not to have to wait for a very long time when they go to cast their vote so we will be notifying the voters once everything is finalized of their polling location change they will be getting a precinct card so we are excited about this we have worked very hard on this this is not something that happens overnight we have literally been working on this since july uh, we were here till 10 30 last night trying to get some things finalized so um, a lot of work goes into changing this and it's not something we enjoy doing but it's something that we have to do um, to make sure that our voters are getting the best treatment that they can that they are not having to be inconvenienced by waiting for three or four hours in line because of the way that our county is voting we are at a 71 percent ratio to our population with registered voters and i'm very proud to stand here and say that um, i want to talk about something i'm very excited about and that's our new voting system i got the word on tuesday that our system will be delivered tomorrow so we will actually get to have it here in our possession start working with it start training on it uh, we will be using the system of course we have been selected as a pilot county for the state one of six we are the largest there will be a lot of eyes on this and a lot of people coming in and out to visit to see the system and we're excited about that so we will be also discussing some town hall meetings to get this into the community so i may be reaching out to the commissioners to join me in your community to demonstrate this system but there again it's going to be a system that uh, we feel is very voter friendly it is voter auditable they can see who they have cast their vote for they're given an opportunity twice to check their um, selections on the screen once they print their ballot they have another opportunity to make sure they have selected who they so choose to vote for they deposit it into the scanner and their vote is cast so it is a whole lot easier to use than the system we have previously been using and the tabulation process and the reporting process will be a whole lot easier and quicker i know most of you anxiously await those results on election night when your name's on the ballot so instead of uploading 400 cards we will now be uploading maybe 20. so we'll get our results out quicker um, and just hopefully not be so stressed with elections on election night so uh, that's the good news i'm going to bring to all of you and if you have any questions um, please let me know um, any comments please let me know but um, i just appreciate the opportunity to serve and we are ready to go into the november 2019 elections and then go fast forward into 2020 and that's what we'll be doing for the next year and a half so Thank you again for letting me speak, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. I'll make, I'll make a comment. For the governor, you know, who's the previous Secretary of State, has a lot of interaction with you and your uh, your, your group downstairs. I know they, they know what they're doing when they pick the largest county for pilot, and so I'm excited to hear about that, and I know, I know that it's in good hands. Uh, two questions for you. Do you have an approximate date when the new precinct locations will be finalized? Um, that will be uh, voted upon on Monday in a special call meeting with the Board of Elections. Do you know how long after that the precinct information will be updated on the Secretary of State my voter page site? Once we um, have the vote, the Board votes on this, uh, we will tell the Secretary of State to turn on that system for us. All that will be updated and voters should be able to go in and see their new precincts by the end of next week. Thank you, Deidre. Uh, I remember when the voting percentage was in the 50s, and now you say 71%, so kudos. I think I know it makes all of us proud to have that percentage. How does that relate, or how does that measure to other counties? Is that on the high, or still low? With the voter to population ratio, 
I think we have an, an above average one because uh, people choose to live here in Paulding because it is one of the greatest counties in this state and they are more tuned in to voting and the issues that are going on now. So I do think that our uh, voter to population ratio is, is high because we are um, a, a residential community and those people are. So I, I'm, I'm proud that our voters have done that, a very small percentage, uh, which you have to think there's a lot of people that live in this county that's not of age to vote. So that percentage is high, the others, simply don't want to be registered or they're ineligible to be a registered voter. So I think we have a really good ratio. We'll take this opportunity just to thank you and your team and your board for all the work you do. I've been educated over the last few years and so much more involved than I ever imagined. Thank you. And I thank you all for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deidre. Thank you. And we have Ms. Amy Tisicek here from Comprehensive Program Services. Always glad to get up there from you, Amy, and thanks for your time this morning. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Well, while she's uh, loading up the PowerPoint, things are going very well um, out at the site. If you've been on the jail website, you can see there's there's progress going on on the outside. Um, you can't, you know, unfortunately see a, see real time um, progress on the on the inside. But I have been posting um, photos, progress photos um, through the beginning of the uh, the project. Um, so when you go on the the jail website, um, you can go ahead and, and take a look at those. And as we go ahead. Um, Progressing, I'll upload um, some more photos for you. Um, so, as you can see, um, progress right now. We're uh, getting some curb in. Um, we're getting GAB stone in for the drives and the parking lots. Um, so, again, a lot of good progress on on the outside. Um, the weather, again, is 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 agreeing with us. Um, which is great. So it's leading to uh, some good progress. You'll also see out there um, light poles going up. So you'll have uh, some added security at night um, around the site. Uh, project budget update. There has been since the last meeting no changes. Um, see that the overall total uh, budget, including all of the change orders that have been approved to date, um, we're still at seventy million six hundred and twenty-six thousand um, dollars construction contingency is currently just above uh, five hundred thousand dollars so um, not much of a change with that um, we're in good shape um, for a contingency where we are with the project um, upcoming and under review items there's a couple change orders that we are um, currently reviewing and uh, we'll be coordinating with Scott on this. Um, we do intend to try to get these on the agenda for the next meeting, um, which I believe is October 8th. Um, change order number five um, includes uh, just additional general conditions, demucking costs. Again, that's um, when you look at those numbers, they are significant. So we've been reviewing these um, actually quite a while. Um, before and vet through them before we even take them to um, Scott to, to coordinate and review. Um, change order number six, um, $97,722. Um, this includes some flooring revisions. Um, and the reason why we, we made these revisions, we went with a LVT instead of a BCT product. That is, um, not only is it more durable, it's less uh, maintenance costs for the sheriff's office, so we definitely feel that was a, a, a good move to, to go with that product and change up that material. Um, miscellaneous changes to improve functionality and operations in, in the uh, jail and LEC. Um, I think I mentioned before um, at some meetings, it's, it's extremely hard for an owner to, to really understand um, how they're going to operate the facility until it really starts getting built and, and they really start thinking through day-to-day -day operations. So the, these miscellaneous changes are, are not unexpected. 
um, it definitely is an improvement and to the, the sheriff's office operations. So, um, last item, and I think that's later on the agenda as well, to approve um, the water meter um, cost from the uh, county stock, and the uh, water meter would be installed by the um, subcontractor for Turner. Projected budget through completion. Uh, the only change to this since the last updated meeting, um, we have increased uh, or actually de decreased a little bit the ad services for Wakefield Beasley under the architecture engineering contract. Um, that is later on the agenda to be approved for their change orders in the amount of 68000 So that's the only uh, change that you'll see. As far as the projected budget, we are still, um, we are still projecting that uh, we're at 72.8, um, and that includes additional funding for, um, we, we already have the, the numbers in, uh, included for the change orders that I mentioned a couple slides ago. So those costs are already factored into this number, as well as um, an increase in ff &E numbers based on where we are with, with the overall budget. And then progress, um, again, you'll see site work evolving. Uh, light poles are being installed uh, at visitation. You'll see the, the structure going up, um, roofing going up very soon. And then we'll start the, the uh, interior fit out drywall and interior finishes on that. LEC, ceiling grids, lights, kind of more of all the, uh, the pretty aesthetics you'll, you'll see um, being completed at this time. Um, support, kind of the same thing. It'll follow ceiling grids, lights, uh, painting, door installation, and then uh, in housing, just finishing up ceilings, painting, again, um, fitting out those areas. And then some progress photos. <coughs> See, this is a uh, photo of a typical day room and control room. Um, you'll see that the, the block and the, uh, the framing for the control room windows, um, those should be installed in the next couple of weeks. Um, LEC, you'll see a lot of the, again, a lot of the drywall interior finishes starting to, to be installed. Painting going on, um, you'll see uh, in the next month flooring starting to, to uh, be installed and uh, a lot of the finishes in the, uh, the secure areas are sealed concrete so um, we'll see that starting here in the next um, several weeks to get those cleaned up and, and sealed. Um, tile is, is starting to be installed in the more administrative type uh, restrooms and then you'll see on the right hand side um, one of the electrical panels for the, the uh, law enforcement center installed. Uh, schedule update, um, we are still looking at a mid-December um, date for the housing substantial completion. Um, some of the other areas fall in before that, um, but we're still on track for, for that mid-December time period. Um, final completion, we're looking at um, February 20th. Um, the next several months, um, I'll, you'll probably see me up here a lot, um, we're going to have a lot of FFE items coming before you for approval. So these are things, furnitures, um, any type of equipment. Um, the cabling is, is started in the building. Um, we have the AV RFP out right now for bid, and we should be getting those back in a couple weeks. So I hope to have um, something for you for the next agenda um, for recommendation on that. Questions? Forgot what FFE is, furniture, what else? Furniture, fixtures, and equipment. It's all the pretty things you get to see. <laughs> We're also pleased to have uh, president, two presidents here, uh, Tim Collins with Turner, raise your hand And uh, Eric, I know he wants to be introduced, but no. <laughs> Eric Johnson, the president of uh, Conference and Program Services. Um, just an interest I would have is, you know, the economy's good and there's so much construction going on. How does that affect your ability to, to get subs or has it affected? 
it, it, and I think Tim from the construction side can, can surely attest, but it's, it's hard. Um, you know, we did, um, for an example, we put the AV RFP out to bid um, for the first time about a month and a half ago, and we got zero bids. Um, and then I think Joe Hagler reached out to a couple of them to see kind of what, what the issue was, and basically they didn't have time. So it's, it's, it's definitely a, a, you know, a, a factor these days to get, get people interested in projects. But, you know, um, we feel confident that this next round, and it fell around Labor Day as well, so that didn't, you know, didn't help. I think people just ran out of time, but um, I think, you know, with this next round for the AV bids, we'll, we'll, we'll get sufficient numbers back. But overall, it's, it's, it's harder, you know, than it was five, five, ten years ago to, to get participation from subs because they are so busy. Other questions, comments? Good report, Amy, as always. Thank you for being here. Thank you. We don't have anyone that signed up for um, agenda items of public participation. We have to improve on our agenda here to get more participation. <coughs> Thanks for laughing, Pastor. Um, under consent agenda, <coughs> we have one, which is uh, this discuss action to authorize the chairman to sign a quick claim deed to swap the right way along Pine Ridge Lane um, to DR Horton, Post 4. And I'm asking this time if anybody would like to move that to the regular agenda. I can't believe it where it is. Uh, we have no old business under new business. Like quite a line up here. Uh, we'll get after it. New business number one is discuss action to adopt the FY 2019 budget amendments. Ms. Pollard is for it. Year 2019 amended budget. First, I want to explain why we have 2019 amended budget up on the for adoption when we're actually in 2020. So 2019, we finished June 30th. Um, it's not just made up of the general fund. That's what our focus is most of the time. That's where our primary funding comes from. But we have about 20 funds. So. We have a lot of funds that are held with constitutional officers, and those constitutional officers, we don't have their, we don't keep their fund, their um, accounts. They keep them, and then at the end of the year, they send them over. But you have a beginning budget, so when you adopted the 2020 budget, you adopted a budget for those funds, and you have um, then once the year's over, you have to amend that budget so that it matches with what actually went occurred, the transactions that occurred within the 2019 year. So we don't have that until July. So we hold all of the general fund budget. Um, those are things that have taken place throughout the year. Items that have been on the agenda that cost money, that wasn't in the original budget, that you um, approve, and we consolidate all of those and put them into one item. So to cover this, first I'm going to talk about what how we ended the year, because that's what most want to know. So if you, um, I have some handouts in the back, and each of you should have one that looks like what's on the screen. And if you will go to, my focus is going to be on the general fund, again, because that's where um, the funding for general operations at the county government are. So if you'll turn to page six of that handout, This is a list of all the departments, and it's got your original budget, your revised budget, so your original budget, and then the final budget is the budget including the amendments. And then you have the <coughs> actual, and then you have the actual from 2018. But for the sake of 
time and keep it short. this so everybody can see and I'll just have to tell you what those headings are so the, this first column is your original um, budget this is your expenditures so our original expenditures were budgeted at 71 million um, the revised expenditures were 73.5 million and your actual expenditures were 68.2 million um, so if you go down to the bottom your excess so how did you end the year with an excess 7.2 million dollars we had obligations so during the year we issued purchase orders we obligate funds and we don't spend all of those funds well at June 30th those obligations don't just go away the vendors still working on them and we had 8.6 million dollars in obligations for the 2019 year so if we had spent that 8.6 million dollars you would have 1.4 million dollars used of fund balance is what you would have used. Does that make sense? Um, and the budget, the original budget, had a plan to use 1.9 million dollars. So now that, unless you have any questions, I'll go to the specific budget amendments that are before you and the reasons for them. Okay. And the other handout that you have is Okay, these are the budget amendments that are actually before you. Um, so this lists all the funds from Russell Paul. General fund, fire, special revenue, um, E911, your special ports, those are your constitutional officer funds, solid waste. Enterprise funds are, um, they're there, but they're a flexible budget because if you don't have the funds, you can't spend the money. They operate like a business. Um, your SPLOS funds, your debt service has a tax, and your CIP funds, those are, primarily this one is the jail fund. It's basically what we're funding out of this with a few other construction projects, but not, not a lot. Now, the, on the next page, you have the expenditures. Um, well, I'm sorry, let me go back to your revenue increase. So, I didn't have a prior year fund balance budget in this amended portion because you didn't use any of my balance. So, I um, reduced that and increase some of the revenues to better reflect what was actually received. So the property tax didn't change. The other tax, which is primarily your loss, um, your title of warrant tax, and the um, insurance premium tax, those were all taxes that increased. So that increased that number a little bit. Licenses and permits, that number didn't change. Intergovernmental. Those are funds that are received for, from federal or state for some of the operations. Primarily, that's your LME funds um, for the year. Charges for service had a small increase. Fines and forfeitures did increase. Investment income has increased. Um, and the contributions and miscellaneous have relatively no change. On the expenditure side of things, on the expenditure side of things, the reasons for um, department budgets to change. Departments are required to work within their budget, and they do unless there's something that's asked of them or they have to make a purchase for something that maybe you approve, and it's um, this consolidation will include some of those amendments. But for the most part, they are a result of your leave buyback. So we have leave buyback. County employees are allowed to sell back 60 hours of leave, and that amount is budgeted in one line item instead of by department. And then when it's expensed, when that, that leave is sold back, it's charged to the department that actually incurred the expense. So 
this reallocates that. Often in large departments, you'll have vacancies that will not require you to move money around like that, but in a small department, you may have, um, you don't have any vacancies, and they fill everything. The budget's an actual number, so when you have more come out in a small department, you can't absorb that anywhere. So it, this does contain some, uh, some adjustments for that. Purchase orders from 2019, I mean from, these were purchase orders from 2018 that moved into 2019. So uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we had $8.6 million, $8 million in purchase orders for going into 2020. We had very close to that amount coming out of 2018 going into 2019. So this approves the budget for those. Um, and DOT has, they have, they have some federal funding that we're not really certain of at the beginning of the year. Sometimes those change throughout the year. Um, we'll have to make adjustments. We also have a transfer of $1.5 million that was made to the water system. That was to take care, we've talked about this for years, but when the water system actually moved, it came time to make that transfer. Um, the GSP post, that building was originally constructed with water and sewer enterprise funds, and it was converted several years ago from that purpose to the GSP, so we repaid them for that building. Then we had some flood lines that were completed this year, and you had agreed to do up to $500,000 a year for those water lines. Well, the water system expended those funds and this is to repay them for the reimbursement for those kinds of general fund that we'll pay. Um, without getting very specific in the details, that's pretty much the gist of why these um, amendments are necessary. So I hope I haven't been very confused. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. They can either hand out a test. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good job. Now, number two, new business is discuss action to adopt resolution 19-29, authorizing the issuance of series 2019 industrial building authority taxable revenue bonds in the amount not to exceed five million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to refund the 2011 industrial building authority outstanding bonds and along with um, our finance director we have in the house today uh, Mr. Clifford Bucky Kimsey who uh, I don't think I think it was linebacker at the University of Georgia <laughs> so happy to have him here uh, represent Raymond James who has helped us with these bonds these bonds were originally issued in 2011 there were two series 2011A and 2011B, and occasionally the opportunity presents itself for us to refinance those bonds and save some uh, interest funding. So th that's what's happened in this case. Um, there is a mechanism as to uh, an interest that you want to be, an amount that you want to be able to earn before you'll do that, and we have reached that, and the numbers that I have probably have changed, so Becky's going to talk to you about how much, what potential savings we have um, in refinancing. And that fund, I guess that terminology is very confusing. So bonds are sold in very small increments. And when those bonds are sold, you can't just refinance them like you do your house. Um, we have to actually borrow the money to pay off those bonds. So the, and it's called refunding. And so we'll pay those off, and this will be another issue. But the entire issue that we're looking at for this 20, this issue in 2019 will be to refund those um, existing 2011 bonds. Tabitha knows more about this than I do. I can assure you she knows everything about all the financing that y'all do up here. 
Before I get started with this, I just want to say that uh, we were honored to uh, finance the, the, um, uh, the, the detention center a number of years ago as well. And I, my recollection is that, that we had to have a referendum on that, and I think it passed overwhelmingly. So I think there was a lot of support for uh, in the community for that. But uh, we obviously appreciate uh, being involved in that uh, transaction. I have to admit, I do not know what demucking is. I've got an idea. I don't know if it's nasty or not, but whatever, whatever. Now, what we've been talking about with refunding or refinancing, refunding is just a fancy word for refinancing bonds, and we only do that when the bonds can be called away from their owners, and uh, if interest rates cooperate with us and, the finan and it makes sense financially to do it, if it makes, uh, makes good sense to do it. And in our case, what we talked about just recently when we were here in June, the number was 500, the savings was $598,000. The savings today, uh, based on current information that we have, is uh, $761,000. Now, interest rates in our, our business change every day, and y'all have probably been reading about uh, things that have occurred just here recently, the Federal Open Market Committee met uh, yesterday, uh, they met Tuesday and Wednesday, but they, they uh, went ahead and lowered interest rates by 25 basis points, or a quarter of 1%. Now there's 10 people that vote on that. Seven of them voted to reduce the rates by 25 basis points, a quarter of a percent. Two people, uh, didn't want to change them at all, and one person wanted to do 50, 50 uh, basis points or half of a percent. So they're not in completely in tune with each other, but the significance of this is that interest rates, when they go down, the amount of savings goes up when you refinance those bonds. And so um, it is a, um, it, it, we, we believe it makes economic sense to do this. Um, the number, uh, 761,000, is is a pretty is a is a strong number, particularly in, in view of the 598 that we had. And 598 was a good number. If we have a present value savings above three percent, we think it makes sense to refund mass bonds. And uh, previously it was 9.1 percent. On this now it's 13 percent. It's 13 percent present value savings, which is just a heck of a lot of money. The whole the the, bit, the principal amount is not anywhere near as big as a lot of the transactions that we've done here with y'all, but it's just as important as uh, any of the transactions that we've done. And so uh, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions if anybody, if, uh, anybody has uh, any. Pretty quiet today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Bucky, for taking the time to drive all the way out here and give us an update. So we'll move on to number three, that discuss action to approve the Title VI plan for Georgia Department of Transportation's Intermodal Division. Okay, um, this is, I'm presenting this item only because we have a little bit of federal funding attached to this. So this is the 5311 funds that we received from the state in the amount of 58 thousand um, dollars we have a matching that's 50 percent so we have a 116 thousand uh, dollar requirement for that that um, service one of the things dot has required us to do is to put in place a title six which is a non-discriminatory so it basically says what what discrimination is and it says how we're going to handle discrimination and what we're going to do with it in the event that it occurs so already on our buses, we had forms. Um, everything was available to assure the, the participants that we do not discriminate. But um, the state wanted it all in one central location as to what our policies and procedures were. So that's basically what this does. It says that we're going to um, that we're going to post the procedures on the buses that there is a contact in the event that discrimination occurs or somebody feels that they've been discriminated against, there is um, how that process is investigated and then um, what's the remedy. And it also talks about language. So
also if you have different languages, we have to have it posted on the primary um, languages that are spoken in, in Poland. So basically that's all it is. It's just what we're already doing into written format for the state. So this came about in 1964 and we're just now being asked to put this in writing? Yes, and it's quite a lengthy book she got to put together, report she got to put together. That was a good three hours worth of reading. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, comments? All right, number four is uh, discuss action to approve a lease extension for a cell tower in post one. Currently, Paul County has about 10 um, land leases with cell tower companies, and they all want long-term leases. So they want to be able to go back to the T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, and have um, a lease for a cell tower that has a, quite a bit of time because the equipment's expensive. So Crown Castle has um, approached us for a lease extension and this lease is still not up for a couple of years but they're asking to extend it for I believe 25 25 additional years um, we contracted with um, Georgia Municipal Association with a cell tower um, expert if you will to negotiate this lease for us because there are so many moving pieces. So one is a 25 year lease. So what are we, what one more can be doing in 25 years? I have no idea what cell phones, what the market will be. And they do, and what's generally given for, what's a, a land lease worth? So how much should that land lease be? And then revenue share, and how, how do you deal with those tenants? And they, he, we dealt with Ryan Fender. He um, does have expertise in, in dealing with each of these issues. So what they brought back to us is an increased rent. So the increased rent went from 22000 to 30000 annually. A signing bonus of 15000 So there's 15000 due to Paul in just for signing. And a 25% revenue share, which the existing lease did not have 25% and they have already signed AT&T, so that 25% has already um, got some funding being generated for it as a result. And it does include an escalator. It increases 15% every five years, but that was in the original lease as well. So it seems there's only improvements for this lease. What did you say the current lease? <coughs> The current lease expires, I believe, in 2022. I have to look back to see for sure. Thank you, Tabitha, for all those good reports. Number five is discuss action to approve change order number one in the amount of $68,000 for architectural services related to owner requested revisions. This will be an increase to the existing contract amount of $3,665,000 dated June 19, 2017 with Wakefield Beasley and Associates. The funding is available from within the bond proceeds for the county, the Paulding County Adult Detention and Law Enforcement Center, of course in post two, and Mr. Scott Green is going to report. Thank you, Chairman, Commissioners. If it was all we did every day, um, we could not manage a project of this size. So I appreciate the fact that we have a professional team available to us to, to handle the day-to-day -day decisions. Um, not only are they experienced in this type of work, but um, they've handled very large projects, including the uh, law enforcement type centers uh, all over Georgia, I know at least. Um, we also have the architect, uh, principal architect, Karen Signer, here with us. Um, if there's any questions, and then Amy, of course, uh, with any details you need. I uh, just want to add a couple of comments. Uh, I hope you've uh, read the back up and it's uh, sufficient for the most part. Um, just to review a couple of things that uh, started before the current administration, uh, some of the commissioners took office. Uh, we did have a lot of changes early on. 
uh, particularly with the civil site work in trying to adjust the site and minimize the amount of trees we had to take out. That was important to the city as far as uh, sort of camouflaging the building a little bit and uh, keeping the greenery we had acquired uh, to the north of us as much as possible. Um, also preparing the uh, architectural uh, visuals for the city to approve the site, the 3D fly around, things like that. Those were things that were not anticipated when the architect prepared the proposal. And we did ask them to change a lot of things along the way. And some of these are very good um, to find a cost-effective cost solution to, to things like uh, the visitation center uh, sited on some old uh, unsuitable soils. We were looking at 100,000 or more to, to dig up old soils and replace them with good, good material and rock and, or structural improvements. And we were able to move that facility um, I think it was about a $7,000 change as far as the design, but then we saved basically $93,000 in the process. So there's important reasons why we do uh, go through these changes to benefit the overall project to improve it as we go along, as, as was mentioned before. Um, the sheriff and, uh, and I and staff appreciate this professional team we have. It takes a lot of the pressure off us day to day. You know, the sheriff has more important things to do than to look at foundations and structural work and, and worry about paint colors and, and furnishings and things like that. So that's that's what we hired uh, CPS to do for us, and as well as the architect. Uh, Tim Collins is also here. You introduced him earlier. Um, managing terms of construction. And uh, any of them are available for questions if you have them. Uh, if any of you have not yet toured the facility um, lately, I encourage you to, to get on the calendar or uh, contact Colonel Hunton. Um, they do walk through so every other Thursday. This particular day was today, um, so that might not work out. But um, in, on a future Tuesday or something like that, please please call us so you can get inside before everything's really closed down. And I think you'll appreciate the magnitude and the impressive, impressive work going on in there to deliver this project. Other than that, um, I, uh, I'll let you all ask any questions if you have any for myself or, or Amy. We're here to handle that. Um, in particular, um, right now we're asking for $68,000 for the types of changes that we've encountered so far and, and just a little bit that we might have. Um, I think um, we get projected maybe 100000 overall for this project through the end, but right now we're just asking for approval for $68,000. Thank you. Thank you. Notice the visitation center is coming out of the ground. It is. Right. We're excited. Yeah, you'll see the structure going up again. The roof will come up a um, couple weeks, and then that'll be followed by the exterior um, sheeting and, and start the interior work. Yes, we're, we are glad to be over that room. And then there's another with the law enforcement center here, number six, discuss action to approve funding in the amount of twenty-eight thousand for equipment, materials, and labor to install uh, the adult detention and law enforcement center water meter assembly. Uh, the county will purchase the meter and in turn construction will provide other materials and labor through their subcontractors. Funding is available from within the bond proceeds uh, for the program. It's what Danny talked about before, any, any other briefing? Just to add, we did uh, show on the slides that it would be part of uh, exchange order six, but we went ahead and broke that out to go ahead and get this to you today. Um, we have actually ordered the meter uh, through the water system, so they'll provide that. The part that will actually be contractor effort is about $18,000 of that amount. So uh, there will be a, this will be rolled into a future change order, but we would like you to go ahead and approve the uh, funding for it, and then uh, we'll bring the, the full change order to you on the next available meeting. Are there any questions? Amy, get here answer. Thank you. I know Commissioner Hart really appreciates all the detailed drawings that he said he studied these. <laughs> <laughs> it helped me probably understand that. I'm not sure I did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks much, Scott. Number seven is authorized the chairman to approve and execute the application of the Georgia Department of Transportation FY 2020 Local Maintenance and Improvement Grant LMIG in the amount of two million and two thousand two hundred eighty-seven dollars and sixty-four cents, with the required thirty percent match funds of six hundred thousand six hundred eighty-six dollars and twenty-nine cents, to be used to mill, patch, 
and resurface county roads. Mr. George Jones. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sure Commissioner Harris spent as much time perusing over this material as he did in the previous. <laughs> so, all that aside, and we're requesting the board um, authorize the chairman to accept and uh, approve the LMIG funding from GDOT. The LMIG program itself is funded from state motor vehicle motor fuel tax collection program. Um, the LMIG grants each city and county receives its formula base, taking into account the county's population, road mileage, compared to the entire state of Georgia's population and road mileage. Paulding County, based on this year's formula amount, will receive $2,287.64 2 in LMIG funding. By law, the county is required to provide a 30% match for this funding, which is $600,686.29. As the chairman stated, we plan on using this um, LMIG for the paving of roadways in the county. Um, our match funds are going to come out of the general fund, which we have budgeted for. Um, to receive the funds, we are, provide, we are required to complete an application containing the work to be accomplished, a project list, cost estimate, and anticipated debt um, let date to GDOT. We're not held to or committed to this list. We can change the add roads provided that we let GDOT know of any these changes. Um, as the chairman is committed to, uh, as basically we're asking the chairman to obligate the county to provide the match funds over $600,000, we felt it was important to have board approval for this measure. Um, the LMIG program, I believe, is very, uh, it's a very beneficial program to this county, you know, it to the $2 million, and each year we typically uh, pave our roadway paving program, the amount of money spent is, is well in excess of $2 million. Respectfully requesting that the board approve this. Just so you know, I do read it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have about seven seven uh, different roads yes, that are sir. listed in here? Can you? If we go over those roads, um, I was thankful to see two or three of them. <laughs> Davis Mill Road, uh, Garmin Road, Wall Road. Mount Marana Road, Debo Road, Waters Road, and Hughes Road. And again, you know, this list is for GDOT, and we're going to come back whenever we do let a contract and officially show this to you again. But um, like I said, these roads can be changed. I don't anticipate them changing out, but we just have to provide the list now for GDOT. There's no mention of SPLOSC in this agenda item. So this comes out of your DOT budget? Yes, sir. We requested this year with this in general fund, but it matched be general funds. When we let out pay the contracts, we'll, um, we'll end up using some SPLOS money for uh, you know, all the paving that goes on. But this portion right now, we're just you know, allocating general funds towards the GDOT match. Other questions? Number eight is also yours, George. Discuss action to adopt ordinance 19-05, creating provisions regulating the placement of small cell facilities and tenants and associated poles on the county right-of-way. Uh, it's consistent with the uh, Georgia Streamlining Wireless Facilities and Antenna Act. That's OCGA Title 36, Chapter 66C. It's all yours. Yeah, the Georgia Streamlining Wireless Facilities and, and, and Antennas Act, otherwise known as SWFAA, does not really flow off the tongue well, so I'm just going to keep using the, the term SWFAA. Okay, basically allows small cell devices, associated equipment and poles to be placed on the counties and municipalities right of ways. Um, basically the law provides a process where providers can deploy small cell wireless devices on new and existing poles on the right of way. Um, I kind of want to go about how we got to this point because we didn't just develop an ordinance just to develop an ordinance, but why do we need the ordinance? Um, a small cell installation consists of radio equipment and antennas that can be placed on structures. Like I said, um, structures such as street lights and utility poles. Small cells um, basically are wireless hotspots that uh, fill in coverage gaps, um, increase network capacity, and extend service from larger cell towers. Uh, we use the term small cells um, to kind of differentiate from the large cell towers like the macro cells, which are like 400 feet tall. We're talking poles that are 50 foot high max, small cells. Um, why did this law come about? Why do we need this ordinance? Um, the way we communicate, send, and receive information has changed dramatically over the past 20 years. 
returning increasingly to wireless networks and mobile technology. AT&T provided us information earlier this year that their data usage has increased by 360,000% since 2007. Um, as this trend continues, you know, providers are expanding the ways in which they can satisfy the need to provide and accommodate this data usage for their customers. And that's how this law came into effect. Um, the law as drafted you know, takes into account a majority of factors. However, some items not addressed, um, particularly concerning aesthetics and appearances our ability to regulate the equipment on the right way in terms of those appearances. To protect the cities and counties um, from the, with the effects of the law, the ACCG and the GMA developed a draft ordinance to provide government entities controls on aesthetic appearances consistent with the law. You know, we've had some inquiries from various companies regarding the placement of small cells on the right of way already and we could possibly receive an influx of permits once this law takes effect on October 1st of this year. To protect the right of way, I, I recommend that we pass this ordinance to give us the controls um, to inconsistent with law for aesthetic controls. Um, as part of this, the request for the small cell ordinance um, is the ordinance itself and the, the aesthetic standards for all items on the right of way. Uh, per the SW, FAA, and the Federal um, Communications Commission, we're not able to just single out small cell providers in terms of aesthetics. We have to uh, make that applicable to all um, utilities within the right of way. So that's the aesthetics insert along with the small cell orders. I want to say we do have the ability to go back and you know, revise this in the future as needed. However, I think this is a good start to basically get us ready for this October 1st deadline. And uh, I'd like to thank Jason Phillips for his work on this and uh, asked to do a law at the last moment and our staff, engineering staff, really worked hard on this. And hopefully I can answer any questions you may have. So just for clarification, this doesn't grant anyone permission to put that up that's given the act that's passed by the General Assembly. So yeah, this, and basically the way the law is written, you know, they still have to come forward to us, provide us their plans, show where they're going to put it. They can't just go do whatever they want. However, um, you know, we, we can't just deny folks, these providers, we can't say no, you can't put it on there. They can put facilities out there consistent with the law. And, and those, the equipment that goes there, that, that rides or extends their own network. It doesn't ride any network that the county maintains. Is that correct? No, sir. It is, like I said, it's their own network. Um, you know, they can place it on utility poles, possibly our poles if we have any out there. But it's just for their network. What's the size of the one? Um, I believe the way the law and our ordinance is um, constructed, the poles can be 50 foot maximum height, and then you, you know you have an antenna on top of it. But the, um, the boxes themselves, which will be mounted either on the ground or on the pole, I believe it's regulated to a 28 square foot, or 28 cubic foot measurement, so roughly three, three and a half by three and a half by three and a half. Thank you so much, George. Thank you. Good. New business number nine, discuss action to award a contract to provide a capital improvement program inspection services to Atkins North America in the amount of $372,682. This is post four, and this asks for to report. Let me clarify, we have a typo on, uh, on, on this. This is primarily a post story. Uh, we, have, uh, we currently have Atkins um, Inspection Services on our Highway 92 waterline relocation. And um, we ask, as, that pro as the contractor is uh, completing those services and, and things are winding down on that, we have other capital projects in that same area that are that are starting up and so we have um, we are proposing to and we had those construction inspection services undefined um, with the knowledge that this is that Atkins has gained with 92 with the road uh, construction 
and with recommend and with the uh, positive reviews from other utilities in that area of, of their inspector, we are proposing a contract for inspection services that for East Hiram sewer and other capital improvement projects. So that would provide us the opportunity to use this inspector not only on East Hiram, but on the Copper Mine expansion, um, as well as have some county eyes on uh, the Ridge Road sewer improvements. The, um, it, this would be a full-time inspector. It's an hourly rate contract for those inspection services. Um, and that hourly rate includes all costs, vehicles, uh, cell phones. There are no additional costs um, to, to be charged to the county. Um, it does have, should we find that uh, we do not need that, that inspector any longer, then we, we, there is the ability um, to cancel the contract with, with 15 days notice. At this point, with the funding, uh, this funding, of $372,682 is expected to be able to provide for uh, services through February 2021, so about 15 months. Oh, sorry, that's not right. 18 months. <laughs> And, and the pay, the uh, funds would be paid from the renewal and extension fund, which is consistent with our capital improvement program. Questions, comments? You did a great job. That's the conclusion of our regular business. Uh, we have no one who signed up uh, for non-agenda items. And I'd like to thank uh, Bucky and Amy and Tim and Eric again for being here today and throughout the meeting. And, we will we'll vote tonight at uh, 7, 8, uh, 7 p.m. on these different items. And uh, I'd also like to thank my wife for being here. She's in the back, and I think she's paid away for 90% of it. <laughs> um, we did have a requirement to join the executive session. No comment. <laughs> We had the requirement for executive session for real estate and uh, potential litigation. So I uh, entertain a motion that we uh, go into executive session. I'll make a motion and we go for those purposes. Do we have a motion? We have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Caper. All those in favor say aye. 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 Adjourn in executive session. Yeah, okay, I call the work session back to order and ask if anybody has any comments. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Motion by Commissioner Davis to adjourn is a second. Second. Second by Commissioner Caker. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Return.